of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy, the God of all comfort. We are still in the year of our Lord, 2023. We thank God for making it possible. He's such a loving Father. He's made it possible for us to still sit at His feet, just like a Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. I don't want us to take uh, our existence, our life for granted. It's not by our smartness. It's God, our Father, who has made it possible. Hallelujah. We welcome viewers across the nations. This is Liberty House International Church coming to you live from the U.S. of A. And you are watching us live on YouTube and uh, Facebook. In case you missed any portion of this live stream, please go to our webpage, libertyhouseusa.org. Once again, libertyhouseusa.org. Or go to our YouTube channel and please type in our name, Liberty House International Church. Look for our logo with the yellow background and you can treat yourself um, with the videos that we have online. It's your responsibility to reach your life so you can in turn impact souls. Hallelujah. All right, so I'm uh, a messenger of the Lord Jesus Christ, an agent of change and transformation. My mission here is to push you forward, to help you advance in your walk with the Lord. And we are living in perilous times. When the Bible says people are given to uh, doctrines of uh, devils, demons, and what have you, and there are so many excesses uh, in the church in some areas, there is error. And uh, it's amazing how people gravitate towards the error. So we make sure we do our due diligence when we stand to minister because we are to contend for the faith. Hallelujah. Anyway, so if I say something that doesn't resonate with you, please don't pick a fight with me or for you are not against you. Hallelujah. All right. Okay, so let's turn our Bibles to, uh, we'll go to the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 10. And I'll start by saying, um, when, we, when we look at life in general, any one of us will, will say that, well, we, we have a way or we think we would like you know, people to treat us a certain way and we will want to conduct our lives also a certain way. But um, the question is, is that the way of God? God doesn't want us to live anyhow. It's not left to our opinion. It's not led to what we think makes sense and doesn't make sense. God definitely is the one that created us. And uh, he has laid down a principle for us to walk in, the way he wants us to relate to one another. And I know some of you, you say, well, you don't know uh, my sister. You don't know how my brother is a pain in the neck. Whatever it is, God knows it. And uh, that's the way he wants us to relate with this one. As difficult as you think they might be. And uh, I know you can say the same thing in some circles where money is concerned, but you have no excuse. Whatever you think, your excuses and so legitimate, you have no excuse because even Jesus said, love your enemies and bless those who curse you. Well, we rely on him because the Bible says to lean on him, not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. As you allow him to direct you, you have wisdom to relate with all these people that you think are very difficult to relate with. People that you think they shouldn't be in your life in the first place. So I have good news for you. The good news is this. The people that you think they shouldn't be in your life and they are pain in the neck, they are part of God's process for you. It's part of God's process of maturing you, growing you up, molding you, uh, shaping you, into what he has uh, designed you to be. It's part of uh, the preparation uh, uh, program for you to be able to stand where he wants you to stand, to know how to deal with difficult people, to know how to minister from him as a source, from his giftings and graces that he's given to you. How do you realize that we are almost running away from everybody? And if, we, if it's, it's, it's left to us alone, then some of us no, I won't say some of us. Some of you will be living on uh, what, Mars and some will be on Pluto because uh, you think people are your problem. Now, but God designed the system such that we will live with one another. Like the parts of the body. There are different parts, but they are still 
one whole, when they are put together, they are, uh, what they are what they call members of the same body. And I'm not saying um, the leg fighting against the hand or your ear fighting against your nose, that kind of thing. It doesn't happen because God has put them together well. And it doesn't matter how at times you want to go a different direction. When you move, the whole body moves towards that direction. And you have to learn from something like that. We have to learn how to live with one another. We have to learn how to cultivate our strengths and manage our weaknesses. We have to learn how to give up our independence of God so we can become interdependent as he has created us to be. Everyone in your life is no mistake. It's a divine design. And if you look carefully and let go of your pride, you realize that everybody in your life, as painful as their dealings with you might be, you are still learning something valuable. And hey, part of the good news is this. You know, whatever the enemy uh, means for your good or uh, intends for your good, God turns it. He turns, I mean, for your, uh, whatever the enemy means, workings against you, something bad, something negative, God takes that same thing and he turns it for your good. Including your own mistakes, he turns it for your good. So now, if they are in our lives, we have to praise God in his wisdom. He knows why, you know. So I'll give you a particular scenario. Um, Joseph's brothers, they, they sold him. They thought probably, yeah, that's it. We've dealt with this guy. There's no way he's going to be, what is he talking to us about these dreams that God has revealed to him. Little did they know that they were pushing him closer to his destiny. So I want you to, I want you to understand that whatever is going on in your life, that is what is going on, God will turn it for your good. Hallelujah. God doesn't waste anything. Just a technical hitch. We'll get it corrected. God doesn't waste anything. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Then give me another mic because my thing is too low. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Just a second, guys. We have a technical kind of issue here. All right. Okay. That's good. Okay. That's good. All right. So, thanks for the patience. And uh, thank you. Uh, those are the sound words. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, you know, if you have understanding of the scripture, if you understand the ways of God to some level, you won't be bothered about, uh, you know, what is going on, especially people who you think are mean, they are ugly. Um, to you, they are not a, a plus, they are a minus. You, you won't have a problem with them because your understanding of scripture will let you know that even though they think they are doing whatever they are doing against you, and you think that this seems like is working against you, God is still working with them for your good. That's it. It's just like the Bible says in the book of Corinthians, if the um, princes of this world have known, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. They thought they were putting Jesus Christ on the cross, you know, just get rid of him and everything is over. But they didn't know that putting him there rather, they were helping God fulfill, you know, uh, his assignment, his purpose concerning Jesus Christ. And you look at the result of them trying to put Jesus, they think ending, you know, the life of Jesus. So in the same way, we may not understand the things you are going through now. They may be difficult, but you see, we have the grace of God and His grace is always sufficient. We can power through, we can go through, we can endure. Whatever comes our way, we have the ability to endure. So just endure. Hang in there. Hang in there. Be patient with God. He's working on something. And God is never late. And He does not disappoint. So one of the things I want to talk about Sunday, we're talking about that, is the fact that even though we can pray at home, even though we can read our word at home, even though we can study, uh, so to speak, our word at home, and even though we can do our individual worship at home or wherever we find ourselves, still God in his wisdom wants us to come together from time to time or certain times in the week to come together as a body corporately 
to pray, corporately to worship, corporately to fellowship. That is important. Understand, you say, well, and when the Bible was written, like technology had not advanced to this level, we may have advanced. No, no, Canada, stop that. There's a reason why we can come together. And uh, I want you to think about this. You know, we have uh, universities or well, colleges and programs that we do online. And but you can tell that when it comes to certain things, online will not cut it. And you have to understand why. I don't know where technology has advanced to. I'm not in that world, so I can't tell. Whether now, if you're going to practice as a surgeon, you don't have to really have, you know, be in the, uh, what do you call it, the surgical ward, and then you can watch some videos, you can be online, and they will tell you what instruments they are using, and how to go about the procedure, and whatever. I don't know if that is uh, for real. But what I know is that there's some practicals that, you know, is taking place. So in the same way, we have to appreciate that kind of uh, part of life, and we don't have to throw it away. Every part, every arena of life is necessary. We can, um, as it were, elevate some parts over the others, just like the parts of your body. You can say certain parts of your body are more important than the other parts. There's no part that is more important than the other part. All the parts are equally uh, important and equally uh, interdependent. That is that is what it is. Your function is needed. Every part function is needed. Hallelujah. So I want to say, if if you are having a hard time with this, you have some going out to do. I'll say this to you: Jesus, who came to rescue us, He came to the world to to save a dying world, to help people who were desperately in need of a savior. Yes, so the same people were attacking him. He could have packed his stuff and said, okay, enough is enough. This is over. These same people, I don't know what is going on with them. I mean, there's must be something with their thinking or whatever. But no, he stayed put. And he kept, you know, moving forward. He endured all the, what do you call it, persecution and what have you. And he was obedient to the cross, death on the cross. In the same way, we ought to lay down our lives one for another. So back to the gathering. In um, what? So let's look at Hebrews chapter 10. We will take it from 23. We will read it down to the 10th verse. Let us hold fast. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful now people read this and they, they will just go through that but it's a big deal he who promised who is the one who has promised god and god is faithful to his word he does not disappoint so let's hold fast there shouldn't be any wavering from anywhere we shouldn't consider any option well, it, there may be some delays, but the rest are short. According to his time that he has, he has appointed, we are going to see manifestation. 24, and he says, let us consider one another. Let us do what? Consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Hallelujah. Let us hold that tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let's think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Why is he saying that this particular verse you are reading? Because 23 was telling us we should not be wavering. It tells us that we are going to be engaged in times, we are going to be interacting with people that their conduct or the times or position, the challenges can bring us to a place where we are not wavering. We will question our faith in God. We will question if what we are doing is working. We will question if God is with us. We will question if his promise is true. But it says, don't waver, just like Abraham. He did not waver at the promise of God. He didn't struggle at it at all. The Bible says that he was strong in faith because he was persuaded that the one who has promised him is faithful. Hallelujah. 
In the same way, he waited and waited 25 years. God came through for him. The problem being yours is just two nights, two years, and you're already tired. Be encouraged. Hallelujah. So don't waver. Don't let the storms of life move you. Don't let the challenges stop you from uh, holding fast to the confession of the expectation that you have in Jesus Christ. Faithful is the one who has promised he will deliver. And um, I want to add, this is one of the ways that when we come together as a church, we are able to build up one another, encourage one another, stimulate one another, stir up one another. If one is going down in the expectation, then one can you know, hope again in Christ or can have a kick, you know, so far as the expectation is concerned. So there's, there's not going to be a moment for discouragement. Hallelujah. You know how it goes. When you say you are alone by yourself and discouragement hits you, then you are talking to yourself. And yourself allows you to look at the situation. And then with the Holy Ghost, that is not invited to the conversation. So you have to keep having this conversation with what you are going through. And then uh, the, the, what do you call it? Uh, what was the name? The situation out, 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 out talks you, as it were. And then you are giving into everything. But when you are together with the body, once again, that is where Bible talks about um, the gift of uh, prophecy or prophesying. So prophesying or prophecy can come out to comfort, to edify, you know, to exhort. Hallelujah. Once uh, the preaching, song, whatever, when we come together, these things come out to encourage us. But when you're alone, because I minister to people, there are times I didn't tell them, uh, play some worship music and just worship the Lord. Play some music that will make you dance. But where they are, at times it's just too low, they can play a danceable kind of a song and so they'll be seated or slouched in their couch. That's how terrible, and that's how, uh, what do you call it? Depressing some situations can be. But when you come together corporately, the Bible says iron sharpens iron. When you come together corporately, there's something that happens. You know, it may be you are down here, somebody is up here, up there, and then you know the interaction is going to help us come to a place where we all find ourselves uh, on the same level, which is good. So stir up one another. Hallelujah. One of the ways to do that is to gather. No wonder 25. We are still in uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Forgive me for sleeping so fast. I'm hurrying up so I can close early and go home. Because we'll be here tomorrow in the morning. And the time is 10 a.m. sharp for the um, Ladies Empowerment Conference. It's happening tomorrow live right here in this building. Hallelujah. 647 Thailand Turnpike, Manchester, Connecticut. All right, so it says, 20, 25, not forsaking the assembling of your souls together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day of approaching. And uh, I want to zero in first, or bring this point out, as is the manner of some, the manner of some, as is the manner of some. As is the manner of some. This manner of some is referring to those who neglect the assembling of ourselves together. I'm going to say that again. We are being warned not to be part of some. Some individuals, some people, the manner of some. Their, their way of doing church, their way of uh, their Christianity their way of relationship with Jesus Christ is to do their own thing. But he's saying that don't do that. The Lord of the church has instructed that we come together from time to time. So this manner of some, they don't like to come together. They'll say, well, if we're going to have it uh, online, you know, why do I have to go? It's the same thing. So they'll see home. And unfortunately for most of these people, okay, some of these people just to be you know, politically correct. For some of these people, this broadcast can be going on and still they don't tune in. Or they'll listen to the beginning. The rest is another story. Or they even forget that it's on. Then at times, because I was talking to some people, they'll tell, oh, well, 
You know, I didn't even forgot it. When I realized that I had to tune in, I mean, pray all that and whatever, they said, oh, half of the time is not. So I said, well, blah, blah, blah. You know, this is what is happening. So please, speak truth to yourself. Be sincere with yourself. All these things are designed to keep you on your toes. They are ways that God uses to grow us as a saint and ways to maintain our walk with the Lord. Ways to keep us striking on the path of righteousness. Ways to keep us walking in love. Ways to make sure that we are representing Jesus Christ well. Because a threefold call is not easily broken. Anytime the devil will feast on you, he will first have to isolate you. And no wonder these days people are falling. Like, uh, what do you call it? Apples from the tree. Because when he isolates you, he will first give you a reason why you think you should be isolated. Or why you think you can be on your own. Oh, you can handle this, you can do this. So it starts in small, small ways. You disconnect from this, you disconnect from that. Now, for some people, life is, look, life is not about going to work. For some people, it's all about working, 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 working. And because I talk to some people, and even Sunday is a problem. Sunday, even Sunday, one, one day in a week, not even a day, some few hours, three hours, let me put it that way. In a week, that you are going to be corporately, you are going to come together to fellowship with the saints, to fellowship with the people of God. That is even a challenge. And, you know, it's not like we are growing or we are learning how to even relate so the more you disconnect, the more you isolate yourself, and you stay home, and you stay wherever you are as an individual, the more you are depriving yourself of um, the principles of relating with one another. Because you are not even doing so good with your own siblings, with your own parents. I'm speaking generally. So don't, 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 don't start your thing that, you know, that is not, whatever. So if you should stretch it, that should be happening from your world, home, and then it has to spill over to where you work, to your friends, your campuses, where you go to school, wherever you find yourself. In the local assembly, we should have that. We should have deep and profound relationships going on. God kind of relationship, God connected relationship going on. But it's so sad that it's not so in the church. And when these programs are designed to help us grow to, then we shy away from them. We neglect them. Don't do that. Let us not neglect our meeting together. New Living Translation says that. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So if there's something that we have to forsake, we have to forsake our own ways. Not the ways of God, not the instructions of God, not the word of God. We have to forsake our own ways. We have to abandon our own ideas, abandon our own dreams, abandon our own desires. And we have to embrace the, what do you call it, the desires, the ways, the instructions, the directives of the Lord. Hallelujah. The only way we can prosper, the only way we can be fulfilled, the only way we can touch souls and make a meaning out of our lives is to do it His way. You did not create yourself in the first place. So don't think that you are going anywhere without him. You need all the help that you can from him. Hallelujah. He knows you better than anybody. He knows this world than anybody because he created this world. Anybody that you are relating with that you think you get going, you get going on, he knows that person more than you. No wonder today we think that, oh, we are you know, all out there. The next day we are down on our backs. And then we blame God. God, how did you, how come you didn't come through? When this was going on, he was going to do this, and she was going to do that. How come you didn't do that, blah, blah, blah. But meanwhile, you took yourself to that place. And now you want to blame God. You should have missed in the first place. Hallelujah. So let's forsake our own ways and embrace the ways of God. Let's walk with God. The Bible says in the book of uh, 1 John 1, um, 7, it says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. And now let me touch on something too. I want you to know that the devil hates you. The devil hates you like something. Jesus said it. 
If the one hates you, hates you because he first hated me. So the fact that you are a child of God, he hates you. He doesn't want you to make any progress in your walk with the Lord. He doesn't want you to come anywhere close, not even an inch, to your purpose or destiny. He doesn't want you to take a step into your ministry. So he does whatever he can just to ask it well, uh, what was the, what was the word? What was the word? What was the word? To make sure that um, he keeps you in a place where you are distracted. He will keep you occupied with all that he's distracted you with. And you think, well, you are making move. If God is not in it, you are not making any move. Hallelujah. So you have to be careful. But the only way we can maintain our victory over Satan, our you know, chief adversary, the Bible calls him, we have to keep our union, our fellowship with Jesus Christ. We have to walk in the light as he is in the light. We have to walk in his word, which is the light. He is the word. Hallelujah. Now, when we do that, there's no way that the devil is going to have any uh, virtue over our lives. Whatsoever is born of God overcomes. And what, what is that that overcomes, you know, the world? It's our faith. Our faith. The victory that overcomes is our faith. Your faith in Jesus Christ. Your faith in his word. So remember that. And do it his way. Do do it his style. If there's a way I want to title this, probably I'll say, uh, as some people do, or the manner, the manner, uh, the manner of some. Let's do it, the manner of some. The manner of some. That's the title. The manner of some. It says, by encouraging one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What I realize in uh, our lives, the most. Um, Okay, the average Christian, they will not be there to encourage you. They will not be there to push you up. But when something happens, when their harm has been done, then they show up and they say, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. You'll be fine. You'll be all right. Where were you on this one? To encourage the brother or to encourage the sister. That's the problem. We are so busy. We run everywhere. And uh, when we interact with people, we are so insensitive, we don't even know whether it is well with them or not. Whether they are suffering or they are pain, we don't know. Whether they are rejoicing or not, we don't know. And another thing that contributes to that is the fact that people have learned how to wear masks very well. I guess the pandemic training every one of us. So we wear the mask to hide what is going on and uh, the pretense is going on. You don't have to pretend to anybody. Be real. Be yourself. Hallelujah. Learn how to encourage, as the Bible says, exalting one another. Encouraging one another. That's what we have to do. Encourage one another. And um, before we continue, let me go to um, Colossians chapter 3. Let's start from um, the 14th verse. Colossians 3, 14. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. We are busy checking out everything. That's why I titled one of the messages, Love is Major. If, if there's any suggestion that I want to give to the people of God, I would say that let this be your goal, that you are going to major on love. Now you are going to study so much about the love of God. You are going to study so much about how the Lord tells us to love one another. I'm going to major on that, study that. This coming year, that's going to be my goal. I'm going to set myself aside and study on this. That's it. Hallelujah. So we are reading Colossians 3.14. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bound of profession. So it tells me that one has to be intentional. One has to be purposeful. If you don't intend to do it, you never do it. Now, you have your own clothes, you have your own shirts, you have your own dresses, you have your own shoes, you know. But now, the shoes, they don't jump on your feet like that. You decide, I'm going to put on this specific pair of shoes. So love is like that. You have to choose to walk in love. We are wired to love. The love of God is shared abroad in our hearts, in Romans 5, 5. But you have to choose to walk in it. 
You have to make that conscious effort to work in it. That's what I'm saying, that learn about it. And uh, my piece of advice, you know, the time that you keep spending, you said, okay, I'm going to fast, I'm going to fast, I'm going to pray, I'm going to fast and pray. You know, can you change that and say, okay, this time instead of fasting and praying, I'm going to study on love. Hallelujah. All right. Don't hate me, so love me. Okay, so let's read on verse 15. And so the Colossians of the three. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be what? Thankful. Be thankful. I think we have a lot of complainers and memories in the body of Christ. We don't like this. We don't like that. We can complain about even a church, uh, a church service. I'm talking about when we come together. I mean, no wonder you complain because you don't even know what it is in the book. I'm talking about scripture. So you have your own expectation. When we come together, what things we should do and whatever. Well, if you're in a place that is not Jesus Christ centered, then get out of that place. Look for a place that is Jesus Christ centered. But if you are in a place that is Jesus Christ centered and the Holy Spirit is the one who is in charge of the service, He's the person we follow. We don't come together to please anybody. We come together to spend time with the Lord according to His specifications and with one another. A, we benefit from we having fellowship with Him. So think about that and stop the complaining thing. And then uh, be thankful. Hallelujah. Be thankful. That's what the Bible says. It's one of the, the will of God for your life to be thankful. 16, verse 16. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Is it there? Okay, that's a mouthful. But we read it. So, Colossians chapter 3, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you all richly. So here again, that's our responsibility. We have to allow the word of God to indwell us. We have to allow it. You see, it's amazing how we put everything on God. I hear Christians, some Christians, children of God pray. They think they are praying a wonderful prayer with all the emotions and the tears flowing, you know, but it's, it's no prayer. Especially when they pray, Lord, I'm available. I want you to use me. I want you to use me. And meanwhile, they don't even know his word. They are not thinking his word. You want him to use you. One of the ways he can use you is to allow his word to richly dwell in you. So if you are not giving time, you are not giving attention to his word, you are not listening to him. So stop the emotional kind of thing, plea, all the time before you call it prayer, it's no prayer. Father, Lord, I want you to use me. I want you to use me. I'm available. I give myself to you. Only, but you get out from that place of prayer and then you do your own business instead of his business. So beware of that. Hallelujah. You have to allow it to dwell in you. And it says richly, in all wisdom. Then look at what it says. Teaching, and I'll tell you why I brought you to this particular verse. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Singing with grace in your heart to the Lord is talking about also thanksgiving. Now, it says what? Teaching. When you allow the word of God to indwell you, then you are not going to spill out nonsense when you meet your fellow believer. Or you go to the office, you are not going to talk about nonsense. You are not going to talk about things that are unnecessary. Things that do not give life. I'm not saying so when you get to the office, say, hallelujah, praise the Lord, Jesus is the Messiah, whatever. No, that's not what I'm saying. Don't trip. You know, but you have to have the word of God. So you'll be out in season and um, instant, you'll be instant in season and out of season. So when you go to that place, when somebody is talking and then they begin to, you know, uh, give you a hint of hopelessness, you know what to say. When they give you a hint of discouragement, you know what to say. When they give you a hint of helplessness, you know what to say. If they give you a hint of, uh, what do you call it? Um, like uh, they are battling something, they are going through a hard time, or what do you call it, a health challenge or whatever, you know what to do. But when you don't have the word in you, you can meet people like that, and you hear them talk, 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 talk. You say, oh, I, wish, I wish my pastor was here. Oh, I wish so-and-so was even here. You know, but then what are you doing? 
you are part of the problem solving what team. So learn your stuff and be out there. Then it says um, admonish. Admonish is to bring, um, as it were, it's like encouraging. At the same time, making sure that person stays put on the right kind of path. You know, you warn that kind of thing. It says admonishing one another because we all need help and we are all work in progress. So at one time or another, we are going to need somebody to help you out stand where you need to stand. Hallelujah. All right, so I'm going to get off uh, this place. We are going to Acts chapter 2 to start with. Acts chapter 2, verse, um, uh, from verse 40. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 2, from verse 40. I want to bring out um, what, what was going on. The first people that heard the the apostles uh, of Jesus Christ minister or Peter minister on the day of Pentecost. So as of the two on the day of Pentecost from 40, in verse 14, Peter started preaching. Okay? Let's have 14 first and let's take it from there and we'll jump 14. So they were being mocked that they were drunk when they were speaking in tongues and so Peter had to say that hey 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 you are not drunk as you suppose verse 14 but Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. So what I was talking about is a typical example. Over here, something beautiful was going on. But these bystanders are saying that, oh, you guys you are drunk. But because Peter has been schooled, has been trained by Jesus Christ, and he had the word of God dwelling in him, he had a ready answer. So he said, okay, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. Let's read on. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. Let's read on. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So he, he knows his stuff. You see, he's going back as, as far back as the Old Testament. What was uh, prophesied about now that is happening in the day or the time of Jesus. Let's read on. And it shall come to pass. In the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit uh, on all flesh. Your sons and uh, your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Let's read on. That is where all the time when people see me, the way God talks to me is by dreams, by dream. I always say that you have not read the full script. Read the full script. There's much more that God wants to do with you, to say with you, and channels of communication other than dreaming. Like I always say, I like to add that. I'm just saying, if you are in the store now, if you are on campus, you are at work, and there's a situation that God wants to speak to you to take care of, it means that if dream or dreaming is how he talks to you, then that means God cannot use you. Or somehow, supernaturally, you have to fall asleep, even still standing. And then you have a dream, you get a communication, then you help the person out. But if it's somebody that is <laughs> needs immediate help, how long are you going to be sleeping before you dream? Five minutes, power nap, I don't know. Just think about it. That's how we limit God at times in the way we think, instead of exposing ourselves to his word. You have to expose yourself to his word and stop this uh, narrow kind of way of looking at things because his ways are higher than our ways and thoughts, far greater than our thoughts. And he says, uh, on my main servants, on my main servants, I'll pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. Let's read on. Okay, let's jump to uh, 21. 
And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's read on. I want to get to the same point and then I'll jump. Men of Israel, listen to this carefully. All that he did was introduction. Introduction to Jesus, who is the Messiah. So verse 22, verse chapter 2, he said, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by what? Miracles, wonders, signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Let's read up. So he's talking about Jesus. First, he was talking about the fact that these people are not drunk. They are experiencing what God has already promised was going to happen. Him, by him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Let's continue. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it has not, it was not possible that he should be held by it. So he's talking about Jesus Christ showing up. He's talking about his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. Okay, let's continue. For David says concerning this, I foresaw the Lord always before me. On my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. So he's going to another prophecy. So let's jump to 37. He kept preaching about Jesus. 37, verse 37. Three, seven. So when they heard this, the preaching about Jesus, they were uh, what cut to their heart or to their heart, and said to um, said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, "Men and brethren, what shall we do?" Let's read on. We are reading on the way to the forty-first verse. Then Peter said to them, "Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit." Now, I'm reading all this to come to the point to know that they believe in Jesus. And people who believe in Jesus, who have accepted Jesus as their Lord, they follow him and they do his commandments. All right, let's read on. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Verse 40. And with many other words, he testified and exalted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. 41. Then those who gladly received, they were not false. You see, that's the difference. Now, in the body of Christ, in the church of God, in some circles, gimmicks are being used. I know a case where they said when people visit, they should give them so that. They think giving people so that will make them sick. So we even went to the center of giving uh, $50 to a person who visit their church and whatever. I mean, this is just too much. It's getting all hurt. They are importing things from the world to please people. No. If the word, if the word, if the word of God, truth, does not or cannot make that impression on people, move them to bring about conviction, that you will accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah, tricks are very terrible. Guinness, terrible. Don't do that. God doesn't like that. And you are not representing Jesus Christ well. Those who gladly received his word were baptized. He's saying his word, Peter, what he preached, but it wasn't his word. It was our Jesus. That day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Let's read on. 3,000 souls added to the church. And they continue the souls, the 3,000, who joined the apostles and the other disciples, because there were about 120 in that upper room. 
And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine or teaching. I want you to understand how relevant that is. Apostles' doctrine, teaching, because they were teaching what Jesus said to them to teach. It wasn't their opinion. So you have to understand that. And one of these days, I'm going to start to teach on uh, this doctrine, the doctrines of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus. So probably you are saying, what? Well, they are the teachings of Jesus. Yes, we are going to talk about that. And fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Okay, let's move on. Did we read 41? We did, right? We read, we, did we read 41? How come I don't remember? Okay, so for, for, for the uh, two, one more time, they continued in the apostles, steadfastly in the apostles, our doctrine and fellowship. Fellowship suggests gathering together in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Breaking of bread. That time they were fellowshipping at times in people's houses. They would gather together, you know, and take care of business. Gather together in prayer. Gather together uh, in somebody's house and pray. All right? So I'm going to take you to uh, chapter 12, where a similar thing happened. But if you read Acts chapter 1, they gathered together. Jesus said they should stay there, you know, until they receive the promise. They stayed there in Jerusalem. Now let's go to chapter 12. And let's take it from one, just to give you the background. And I should stop with this because I don't want to go far. Chapter 12 from verse 1. Now, about the time Herod, the king, stretched out his uh, I'm already, about that time, king, uh, Herod, the king, straight out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. Now, if you saw something like this, you got wind of something like that, then you want to change your faith quickly if you are a coward. Right? And three, and because he um, he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him, Peter, in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. He wanted to kill him too. Verse 5. Peter was therefore kept where? In prison for doing what? Doing what is right. And when I read some of these things, I can't get over it. Somebody comes to a church service and then somehow something is said about their lifestyle that is not correct. It's not in line with the will of God and they become upset. Wow. But constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Now, when we read on, we are going to realize that the church was praying, but they were not sitting, you know, at times in their various homes and houses and saying, we are praying. Now we are doing online kind of prayer. We are praying. You know that some people, they snore online. I mean, it's not happened to online before. If somebody falls and says, I don't know, I've not seen that. I've not heard that too. Yeah, but I've been on one line before that that happened many years ago, before the pandemic. Now, so <laughs> people will say things like, oh, I'm, I'm going to be praying for you. And then the moment they leave your presence, they will forget that you're giving you their word. They won't be praying for you. It's not like that. This, there was commitment, constant prayer, commitment was offered to God on Peter's behalf. Let's read on. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards were the guards before the door were keeping the prison. For a sudden, now behold, we are reading all the way down. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him, saying, Arise quickly, and his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Guard yourself and uh, tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. Verse 9. So he went out. <laughs> he went out and followed the angel and did not know that <laughs> what was done by the angel was real. 
But uh, Saul, he was seeing a vision. He was used to visions. You have to understand that. Verse 10. When they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. Wow, presidential treatment. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. Uh, here, I can't help it. I can't help it but say this. If you walk in the way of the Lord, and if you are in the will of the Lord, doors will open for you. You don't have to knock them down. It doesn't matter how somebody is trying to keep you from entering in to possess what is yours. It doesn't matter how somebody, any demon, is delaying what God has for you. It's just a matter of time. He will, he will fly, you know, the doors of uh, the handles. He will just come open right to you. Hallelujah. Okay, so that was for somebody. Be encouraged. Eleven. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. In the same way, if you walk with the Lord, you can go to prison, you can go through hell, but God will be with you, he will deliver you, he will make sure you come out what victoriously. Hallelujah. So just be encouraged, no matter what you are going through now. Yeah, the, the glory that is going to show up far outweighs what you are going through now. Amen. 12. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. So you see verse 12? Yeah, that's chapter 12, verse 12. Peter came to the house. I, I can speculate that he knew that this was the, the manner, the way that they were handling business. They, they gathered there to pray, nobody. So he went there, and lo and behold, what was going on? They had gathered. Somebody wasn't sleeping in their home. Somebody didn't forget. They moved as a body. They came together as a people. When one was attacked, it was a whole that was attacked. And they stood together for the one that was attacked because it's like they were all under attack. And they prayed. So he says that uh, they were gathered together. They didn't gather together online. And I'm so happy you know that at that time, technology has not advanced, so there wasn't any kind of online kind of thing. All right? There wasn't anything like online. So get a grip. The coronavirus is over, COVID-19 is over, the pandemic is over, be on track, be on track, be on track, and do it nicely, purposely, intentionally, the way that is pleasing to God. You are not pleasing anybody, you are pleasing God, and in pleasing God, you are helping yourself. Hallelujah. Because Romans 12, one says that we should present ourselves, uh, or present our bodies to God. Obeying Him is, is one way to present your bodies to Him as a living sacrifice. Bible says that it's your reasonable service or worship for you to present, yield yourself to Him. So you follow His word. So in-person meeting is important for you. Make sure I mean, I know people at times are work uh, schedules, uh, you know, education kind of thing, whatever. But you see, this lame excuses that we have at times, we have to know that we have lame excuses and cut it out. God knows that we will marry. God knows that we are not going to remain, what, 25, 27, 37 forever. He knows who we'll have spouses. He knows who we'll have children. He knows who we'll have work to do. That doesn't mean that then his work cannot continue. That we should leave his work for others to do. He wants us at every given time, at every stage, phase of our lives, to still worship and to serve him. In a devoted manner. At every given time in our lives. So please, God is for you and not against you. His instruction is to do you good. So bear that in mind. 
they were gathered praying. And I know it's not just one day, because Peter wasn't released the same day, but they were what? They persevered, persevered. They were consistent, they were constant. They endured. And I know if you were in a situation, you will want everybody in the world to be praying for you. Verse 13. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. In fact, I don't have to go into this because I'll go into something else right at the end of this one. If I read this. Okay, let me just learn the comments because. Wesley recognized uh, Peter's voice because of her gladness. She did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. Wow. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. That means you are crazy. <laughs> Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. So were they praying to see him back or they were praying so what? You would die softly, gently, or what? Or today, it wasn't time for him to be delivered. Now Peter continued knocking. And when he opened the door, and they saw him, and they were astonished. Hallelujah. So that's one of the cases in the Bible to let you know that prayer works. And then coming together, corporately, has its anointing. Hallelujah. In Acts chapter 16, 25, it was Paul and Silas that prayed and praised God. It wasn't just Paul praying because they were in a journey, but both of them, you see, they had understanding of the move of the Holy Spirit. They had understanding of the persecution that was going on. They had understanding of their call. They had understanding of the ministry. They understood that well, Doing the will of God comes with some challenges. They didn't complain. There was no regret. Rather, they praised God. They prayed. The Bible says that the prison doors were open and lives were saved. When you yeah, get a chance, just read uh, Acts chapter 16, the whole thing. And what took them in the first place? They cast out the demon. Just that. They cast out the spirit of divination, sorcery from somebody. Hallelujah. There's a need for us to come together. That's why he says that where two or three are gathered. Now no, because of the way you think you say, well, we can gather online. You know, thank God for social media, what we can do. The pandemic were forced. But you see what was going on during the pandemic, how it was, it was crazy. And people were acting like, oh, they are trying to take this from us. They are trying to take that away from us. And now, okay, we are back. And what is going on? They prefer to be home and then to do online. Please repent. All right, so that does it for, um, for today. I'll end on this note. And I'm going to charge you with the words in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. And like the title is the manner of some, the manner of some. So I tell you the words in Galatians chapter five, verse one and thirteen. Start from the liberty. Well, with Jesus, the anointed one has made you free, and do not again be entangled the yoke of bondage. But by love, serve one another. Love me dearly. Thanks for tuning in.